many of you love your families? <laughs> well, of course, we all love our families. And because we love our families, we want to ensure that our home is built on a firm foundation, that it's structurally sound, covered for protection, and finished to provide blessings for all. So in continuing with our theme on the house and home, we want to provide you with some tools to help you build well. So if you can turn into your booklets to section three and follow along and fill in the blanks. First of all, of course, we have the foundation. And in building our home well, like I said, we need to have a strong foundation. And this represents our values and vision. So that's your little fill in the blank, values and vision. And values and vision will dictate your structures and your strategies. And we have a tool for you to effectively communicate these values. So on your table, your table manager will be handing out this uh, tool called an ethical will. And this is a template that we're going to use. And the ethical will reflects the voice of your heart. Think of it as a love letter to your family a tool to record your personal values, reflections, and other information to subsequent generations, which is an important part of your legacy. Your thoughts, feelings, values, wisdom, and advice can serve as a firm foundation for generations to come. It can bring great peace of mind knowing that what needs to be said will be preserved and shared even when you're not around to do so. Now, this ethical will may include letters, stories, pictures, audio, and even video. And over time, you will want to add or update your ethical will. Share the document with your attorney as you prepare your estate plan, because you want those two documents to work very well together. So let's take a look at that ethical will now that you have it in front of you. Now remember, this is a, a personal legacy document. And first of all, you'd want to write the purpose and why you think it's important to record it. Then you're going to write a little bit about your values, some life lessons. You know, what have your life experienced? What have they taught you? Memories. I mean, here's a great place to share all those memories and some of the stories that you don't want your family to lose. And then the future. What is the future? What do you want to see happen to your family, your, your, uh, your community? And then any closing thoughts or encouragements that you want to leave your family. So after you leave here today, take some time, pray, and think about the legacy that you want to leave for your family. The next part is framing. And the framing represents the legal structures of estate planning. So this is a highly technical section, so please, I know it's getting close to lunch, so hang in with me here. It's going to get a little technical. The purpose of estate planning is to permit us to enjoy our property during our lifetime and then to pass the unused portion to whomever we choose with the least amount of shrinkage of value. And the most basic tools in the corner of your estate plan is the will. And so number one there is the will. Now the will is a legal document and it allows you to name the guardian of your children and specify who will inherit your assets after you die. Without a will, you will have no say in what happens to your property. The state would determine who would be the guardian of your minor children and who would be the beneficiary of your property. Another aspect of the will is the living will. And the living will also is a legal document that a person uses to make his or her wishes regarding life prolonging medical treatments. Some of you have heard that called a health care directive. That's the living will. That's number two. 
In addition to wills, trusts are frequently used for estate planning for several reasons. A trust provides someone to manage your assets, and that's also known as the executor or the trustee. A trust provides greater flexibility. And a trust can be used to reduce estate taxes, probate and administrative expenses, which really can be very expensive and time consuming. The most basic and common type of trust is the living trust. And that's number three, living trust. And that's a legal document created during your lifetime. And just like a will, it spells out exactly what your desires are regarding your property and your dependents. With a living trust, you transfer the ownership of the assets into the trust while you still retain control during your lifetime. You can make changes or revoke the trust at any time. Upon your death, the assets pass directly to your beneficiaries without going through probate. And then number four is family limited partnerships. Now this is a sophisticated estate planning tool to transfer assets, it's typically real estate holdings or a business, out of your estate while still retaining control. This is an avenue where parents can begin to shift wealth to their children while taking advantage of reduced gift taxes and estate taxes. Of course, you would need to see your estate planning attorney for an, an analysis of your particular uh, situation. And now on to the roof. Now the roof represents the strategies that provide protection from the storms and the outside elements. Without communicating your vision and values, the default focus for most advisors would be just standard financial planning and investment management. So here are some strategies that you can use to provide protection. Number one, preserve wealth. Preserve wealth. Are you being a good steward with the resources that God has provided you with? You can do this by creating a long-term financial plan for your family. A plan that incorporates your values and your vision for the future a plan that will allow you to pass wealth effectively to the next generation. Number two, reduce taxes. Reduce taxes. Are you arranging your financial affairs to minimize taxes through effective planning? You know, there are ways to reduce taxable income by perhaps deferring income or shifting income to other family members. Maybe you need to consider tax-free investments or timing the sale of securities in the most efficient manner for maximum tax benefits. Deduction planning will allow you to take all the deductions you are entitled to and then time them in the most efficient manner. And then number three is establish control, governance. Establish control and governance. Are you taking responsibility and control of your values and valuables? The best way to do this is to prepare a spending plan, or sometimes we call it a budget, that reflects your financial goals and to model the five basic money principles, which is on your handout in that shaded box. So let's spend a little time going through those five basic money principles. Number one, spend less than you earn. Oh, what a cop. Spend less than you earn. <laughs> and do this for a very long time. This really is the key to building wealth. Proverbs 13.11 says, He who gathers money little by little makes it grow. Number two is avoid unwise debt. Avoid unwise debt. And essentially this means only use debt to purchase assets that increase in value. 
something like real estate or a business. Because avoiding debt is one of the best ways that you can prepare for a secure financial future. Number three, have a short-term fund for emergencies. Have a short-term fund for emergencies. So keep enough liquid cash in the bank to cover at least three to six months of living expenses. Three to six months of living expenses. And this fund can be used to cover things such as an unexpected job loss or unexpected medical bills, home repairs, or maybe you even want to assist your parents in elder care. This is a safety net to keep you from going into credit card debt. Number four, establish your long-term goals based upon your values. Establish long-term goals based on your values. Meet with a financial advisor that will help you with a written financial plan that will reflect your goals and your values. And then number five, God owns the 10% and the 90%. <laughs> God owns the 10% and the 90%. Yes, God does own it all. And realizing this helps us understand that not only are our tithing decisions spiritual decisions, but all of our spending decisions are spiritual decisions. And our last strategy is protect. So number four is protect. Are you properly insured? Do you have enough protection against death, disability, or long-term care events? Statistics tell us that during our lifetime, we are three and a half times more likely to become disabled than to die. So I would suggest that you review your insurance coverage just to make sure that you are adequately protected. And then the finishes. The finishes represent our desire to bless others. Beauty and craftsmanship really do align with a woman's heart. We have been blessed by God so that we can bless others. We give out of the resources that God has blessed us with. And this is consistent with the, what Jesus taught us in Luke 12, 48. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. So in order to give generously, there are a host of tools that will allow us to give well today and to give well in the future. Ron Blue, who's a well-known financial advisor, speaker, and author, says, do your giving while you're living, so you're knowing where it's going. <laughs> uh, I just love this motto. <laughs> Other tools to help you give well, number one, are bequests. Bequests. And these are transfers of wealth that occur upon a donor's death by means of a will or a trust. And bequests can take on several different forms. There's a specific bequest that transfers a certain amount of cash or property. There's a percentage bequest that transfers a stated percentage of the donor's estate. And then a residual bequest, of course, as it says, uh, distributes out the residual of the estate. We also have number two is charitable trusts. Charitable trusts. And these have been some of the most popular, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to that. The charitable trusts created during life, these are a win-win for both the charity and the donor. Uh, the charities do receive much needed funding and the donor can access much needed tax breaks. Number three are donor advised funds. Donor advised funds. Now these have been some of the most popular giving tools in recent years. Through organizations like the National Christian Foundation, you can set up a giving fund 
and contribute tax-deductible assets in one year, while you prayerfully decide which charities you want to support in the future. And then number four is foundations. Foundations. A private family foundation is a separate entity, privately funded by a family, and it's created for a specific purpose of contributing to various charitable organizations. So let's review. We have built our house on a strong foundation of value and vision. We have talked about the legal structures, the wills, the trusts, and the estate planning that represent the framing. The strategies of protection to reduce taxes and preserve wealth, that was represented by the roof. And then the finishes that allow us to give well today and to give well in the future. Now there's one more component, and I'm going to share with you after you this very important story. If you, how many of you would say that you are a leader? Would you raise your hand? That you are a leader. How many of you would say you are a leader? Okay, I see many hands, but I see some hands not raised. Let me tell you how we define leadership. We believe leadership happens any time that you influence the thinking, behavior, or development of another person. How many of you are leaders? <laughs> right. And I think it's so important today as we're talking about how to live a legacy, how to be a part of what God's kingdom is doing in the world and God's purpose for you and me, whatever our situations are, is we have to know that we're influencers. We are leaders. I heard the phrase stewardship of influence a long time ago now, and it struck me, the stewardship of influence, that we steward our influence. And I began to think about that. What would that look like in my life if I really stewarded my influence? All of me. And I believe that the stewardship of influence, and maybe all stewardship, begins when we take responsibility for the power we have to affect and impact other people. I love what someone else said this morning. There are enough people in this room, enough women in this room, to change the world. Amen. Amen. Well, my influencers in my life, like many of you, when you think about the greatest influence was my, my family, my parents. My parents, from the very beginning of my life, told me that my uh, purpose in life was to glorify God and that my work was to love and serve others. That was what we were to do. And so they modeled that. I, I'm telling you, I love these models of families that have been intentional. And my family didn't write a mission statement. They hadn't thought of that, but they certainly modeled it for my life. And so when there was opportunities to grow me in that thinking, they loved it too. So quickly, there was a couple that came to my school when I was in third grade, and they offered a summer camp that I could go to for two weeks, and it was free. And they had swimming pools. They were going to teach us how to play tennis. I didn't know how to play tennis. I was excited about that. It sounded like it was going to be fabulous. There was going to be campfires every night and s'mores. <laughs> you know, graham crackers, chocolate, marshmallow. I was all about chocolate then and still am, and I was in. I wanted to go. And the only thing I had to do was memorize 300 Bible verses. <laughs> 300. So I took this plan home and I showed it to my parents. They were all about that too. And uh, my pastor father obviously thought that that was a great idea. So we decided that I would get up every day at six o'clock. We set the clock and my father would pray. Mama would cook breakfast and we would memorize those verses. And I remember my father saying, Father, help Phyllis remember these scriptures and plant them as seeds in her heart. And that was a foundation that came into my life. I went to camp, uh, quick story, I went to camp, I had forgotten that I was eight years old and I'd never been away from home before in my life. 
And I had forgotten that no one else in my class had actually completed the assignment, so I didn't know anybody there. And so on, after, as they dropped me off on that Saturday, by Wednesday of the first week, I'd been in the pool. I had been on the tennis court. I had had s'mores, and I was ready to go home by Wednesday. <laughs> Have you ever been homesick? Is that not the worst? So I was so homesick, I called my mother, and I said, you've got to come, and she convinced me to stay until Saturday. So I stayed one full week of my two-week reward. And I remember as we left camp, I looked back in the car, and I saw everybody playing and everything, and I, I was so disappointed that I'd worked that entire school year to memorize 300 Bible verses, and I hadn't gotten my full reward but I didn't know what my reward was. Because in those verses, what I learned, I learned about Jesus. I learned connecting to the Father. I learned when I memorized Isaiah 43 that God had called me by name and I was His. I learned in Psalm 17 that I was the apple of God's eye. Can you imagine? I learned in Jeremiah 33, 3, that I could call to Him and He would tell me things I do not know and so much more. And the foundation of that became the foundation of my life because of that connection. And that spiritual foundation was built. I had no idea what that foundation was going to need to be in my life. Advanced many years later, my daughter was a sophomore. Uh, no, my daughter was a junior in high school. My son was a sophomore in college. And one beautiful spring morning, my husband had a heart attack. And obviously, we did CPR. We rushed him in the, into the emergency room. And as we were going down the road in the ambulance, those, that loop in my head was playing. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And it played again and again in my head as we were riding down the road and as I was praying for my husband. And so... I got to the hospital, they took my husband in, and then we, uh, we waited for the doctor to come. And the doctor walked in and he said, what happened today? And I told him briefly what had happened. And he said, I'm so sorry. Sometimes the first sign of heart disease is fatal. My daughter was sitting in the floor, her head in my lap, sobbing. And in my head, I was questioning. I said, Lord, you said hope in a future and a plan. This doesn't look like anything that I'm going to think is hopeful or a future that I want. And immediately the verse that came to my head was, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know it, Proverbs 3. And I knew that it was about trust. And I said, Lord, please help me trust you more in this. Help me trust you more. So many things happened around that time. We made it, obviously, through the services, the cemetery. I remember going to the cemetery when I was called about the granite marker was being placed. The granite marker came, and I went to the cemetery, and I laid on the grave. And I saw my husband's name written in stone, his birth date and his end date. And then I saw my name to the right, and my birth date, a dash and a blank space just waiting for the final date. And as I laid on that grave, I prayed, Lord, do you know how hard this is for my children? Do you know how hard this is? I don't even know my whole life. My whole life summary is in this dash. I don't know what's in my dash. And I heard immediately, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you till the end of time. I love how the Spirit of God uses the Word of God when we've planted it in our hearts. I rose up from that grave, and I determined that I was going to be very intentional about my dash. And at that time, I have to tell you, we didn't plan very well. We did not know. Um, he was 43 years old. You don't plan at 43. 
And so we had, we literally had no plans about what to do. We did have a will, but it was in a safe deposit box. I didn't know where that was. And so I had to really figure out what to do next. And with my children, we had great conversations about this is how we're going to have to live, this is what we're going to have to do, and this is how we're going to figure it out. I gathered wide counsel, I created systems, I tried to figure out what to do. That's why today is so important, but let me advance it a few more years. Fast forward three and a half years, I married again. And I met this, uh, reconnected with a, a gentleman that I had known 20 years before. And uh, it was so great because he knew my husband and was able, I was able to talk to him about that. So we remarried and had this amazing 19 years. And in that 19 years, we blended a family, my son and daughter and his two sons. And one of the things that happened is that we loved being together with our family. And because he knew my story, we were very intentional about our conversations, all of the things we had talked with our children and talked to each other about what to do if something happened. And it did. July the, ele July the 18th, 2011, we learned that my very strong, big, healthy husband had lung cancer. And he wasn't a smoker, so I'll tell you that. It could have been, couldn't have been more unexpected. Uh, and if you saw him, you would have thought that he was as healthy as he could be. We did everything we could. We um, had the best doctors, chemo, radiation. And those of you who have been through cancer treatment understand the challenge of that, watching someone you love go from very strong, very healthy, you think, to a walker, to a wheelchair, to can't move. And my husband, Buddy, passed away March the 10th, 2012. Unbelievable. Heart sorrow soaked. And those of you who have been in sorrow understand what that means. But I knew what to do. We had, because we had had the conversations, because we had put things in place, because we had been able to plan long before we knew that he would be sick, I knew what to do, and I'm grateful. My son, Brian, is an incredible model of this. After what happened with his father every year, Brian takes time one day. It's a hard day, he says, for him. But he takes time to look through, make sure everything's up to date, that it's current, that it's right. He writes letters to his wife and his three daughters. And he makes sure of the latest things that are happening in their life. And he puts them in a place where if something happened to him, he could go immediately, and she could go immediately, his wife Deidre, and she would know what to do. We have the power to influence so many people in our life if we steward the influence that God has given to us. I want to say this morning, rise up. Rise up, women of God. Find the place where God has given you to speak into, your purpose, your mission, all of the things around your life, and steward it carefully so that others will use it. As I have been thinking about being here today with you, 2012 was such a tough year for our family. I lost my husband in March, my husband's mother in July, and my husband's father in December. And I looked back on 2012 and I thought all I did was write obituaries in 2012. But what I saw in that was this incredible, incredible purpose of God. How he uses people's life to speak into others. And it's in those crucible moments of our life, those moments when our families are watching, when our our friends are watching, our, all of the people in our community are watching, that we get to live out our faith, the core of who we are, 
in the darkest places of our life, we get to stand up. And we get to say God's promises are true. I want you to know this story isn't a story about surviving the death of two husbands. This is a story of God's faithfulness. God did not leave me. He did not. His promises, every one that I know, he kept. And he has continued to keep it. And so I stand with you today in this place where we can make a difference in the world as we steward the influence, no matter what has happened to us, no matter what comes into our life, that we get to respond out of who we are in him. Okay, now that you've heard Phyllis's story, we have one final act of love before this home is complete. And the final step is to create a legacy drawer. Now, a legacy drawer may be a drawer or a file or a binder, and it houses all of the important financial and legal documents your family needs in case something happens to you. Preparing for when you are no longer here really isn't a fun task, but it's crucial that you do so for your family. And it doesn't matter whether you're single with no kids or if you're 75 year old, years old with 10 grandkids. This is a gift that you will give your family. And so if you truly care about your loved ones, you will take the time to create this legacy drawer. And the drawer should contain everything your spouse or your family will need to know when you're not around anymore. Anything that has to do with your financial life should be in there. And we recommend that it contain 10 things. And they're listed there in your handout. Number one is the cover letter or the table of contents. And the cover letter is just a simple letter stating and explaining the purpose and the contents of the drawer. And then the table of contents will make it easy for your loved ones to view quickly what is in the drawer and act as a, and act as a guide to navigate through all of the important documents that you will have in there. Number two are the will and estate documents. A copy of the will and trust document, including the name of the executor and the contact information and the location of that will or, or trust if it's not exactly in that drawer. The original will or trustament should be kept in a fire safe or a safe deposit box or sometimes people keep it at their attorney's office. Number three is your net worth statement and a listing of your financial accounts. Now the net worth statement lists all of your assets and your liabilities. So be sure to list all the financial accounts, all your bank statements, all your brokerages, your annuities, pensions, 401ks, IRAs, personal property that you own, cars and art and antiques and jewelry and collectibles, and your real estate holdings. Those are all of your assets. Then list your liabilities. So that would be your mortgages, car loans, student loans, maybe some outstanding medical bills or credit card debt. Include the account name and the account number. So they, they know exactly where the account is and what the number is. Number four is all your insurance information and include health, car, life, disability, home insurance. It should be combined into one single document for easy reference. List the type of insurance, who the policy is for, contact information and the policy numbers for all those insurance policies. And then five important documents or their location. Birth certificates, passports, social security cards, deeds, those types of documents. Some people choose to store these documents in their home in a fire and waterproof safe. Others consider a safe deposit box to be the best place to store these types of documents. Number six is tax returns. 
So keeping tax returns in your legacy drawer is, is kind of like an insurance policy for yourself in the event that you get audited by the IRS, because most people can't get their hands on, on their tax returns. Some people keep them um, electronically, some people keep them on the uh, website portal of, of their CPA. So anyway, you need to have seven years of tax returns on file. Now, as a confession, I actually have a copy of every single tax return I have filed. But then again, I'm a nerdy CPA, so <laughs> you really only need to keep seven years. Number seven, uh, safe deposit box content listing. List everything that is in the safe deposit box, along with its location. I mean, you kind of need to know where that safe deposit box is in case you're gone. Who has access to it? And just like Phyllis said, where the key is located. Number eight, passwords and PIN numbers. Or the location where you have these passwords and PIN numbers written down. Write them all down. That's passwords, PIN numbers, combinations, usernames. You might want to put these on a spreadsheet, like a password-protected spreadsheet. Or there's several um, computer applications out there that just keep all of your pins and passwords. But you need to have them available for after you're gone and someone needs to access those accounts, they will have all those pins and passwords. And then number nine, funeral instructions and people to call. All the details and specifications for funeral plans should be listed so that your family can carry out your wishes. And that might be everything to the type of music you want played at your funeral, to the outfit you want to be buried in. Also a listing of the names and the phone numbers of the people that should be notified in the event of your death. In addition to family and friends, be sure to include people such as your accountant, your attorney, your financial advisor, and your insurance broker. And then last but not least, your ethical will. We talked about that earlier this morning. We definitely want to include this very important document for our family. So this legacy drawer or file or binder, it needs to be kept in a secure location. Now the one I have is in a fire safe in my home. Now the location needs to be known by your spouse or perhaps a close trusted friend. And I'd also suggest that you inform the executor of your estate just in case something happens to you and your spouse. Some of the information you may want to have on printed copies, where other information you might just want to store electronically and give directions to where that can be found. Now, don't forget to update it. And I would suggest that you review and update your legacy drawer in the first few months of every year, maybe the same time when you're gathering all of your documents for tax preparation. Creating the legacy drawer is really one final way that we can show our love to our surviving family. In the event of our death, really, grief does cloud our mind. So we want the legacy drawer to give our family members step-by-step -step instructions and information that they need to carry on without us. This is one of the greatest gifts that we can leave our family. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.